you're now rocking with Back to School at the Podcast, the coding youth culture, hosted by Luke Hodson, powered by Nerds Collective. Make sure you stay tuned. I am, I, I, I am, you're, you're. Welcome to Back to School, the podcast decoding youth culture, hosted by your boy Luke Hodson, founder of Nerds Collective, the leading youth and culture marketing agency. And on this week's episode, we have a very special guest, Dr. Joy White, none other, socialist, researcher, author, and you've written a lot about um, social mobility, youth violence, grime, music culture, mental health, and more. Welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming, mate. How you doing? I'm good, thanks. You're right, yeah. So um, before we get into it, it's like maybe we could just start a bit about you, where you come from, how you grew up, how you got into um, like s- cultural studies, how you got into researching, how you got into social care. Okay. Um, so I suppose, um, well, so in the introduction, I'm, I'm Dr. Joy White. So I'm a, sen- I'm a senior lecturer um, in applied social sciences um, so I'm an academic, really, but my, my route to academia has been um, not traditional, if you like. So I left school when I was 16 um, and I went to work and I was always um, a mature part time student. So all of my further education, higher education um, was done part time. Yeah. Um, and then uh, um, I worked in a variety of places, including around here somewhere, um, about 20 years ago. Um, And then at the beginning of the 2000s, I was running my own business in Silvertown. So I I had my own company. I did um, uh, training, vocational qualifications. Um, And my business partner was a graphic designer. So we, um, he designed magazines as well. Um, And while I was there, we used to take young people from, I think when they got to year 10 or year 11, they had to do two weeks work experience. Yeah, year... Something. Year 10, I think. Year 10, something like that. So we'd take people from local schools. What area was that? That was in Newham. Is that where you grew up? I grew up mainly in Newham. Um, with my, my parents came here in the 1950s, so yeah. uh, they're, they're classic Windrush. I really dislike that term, yeah. but we won't get into it now. So they came in the 1950s and they came from Jamaica. Yeah. So they did, you know, they did the tour. They went to Notting Hill Gate, Labrick Grove, Brixton, Hammersmith before it was gentrified, Fulham. Yeah. And then finally we end up um, in East London. We end up in Newham. Um, so I did most of my growing up in... And that was you, your sister? Me, my sister, and I've got three older brothers okay. as well. Um and it was very different. Newham in the 1970s was a very um, uh, interesting and challenging place. What, what was so challenging? What was challenging about it? For people that it, aren't familiar with it was it was a place that was um, in a lot of respects was very very left wing, very socialist. Had some really strong principles to do with community, um, but at the same time, at that time, it had quite a strong far right. It would have been a national front in those days. Yeah. Um, so it was quite a difficult place to be if you if if you weren't white in, in a lot of ways. Over time, Newham became more multicultural, became a different place to be. And yeah, and it's still very multicultural and that's reflected in, I think, in some of the the the, the sounds that came out of, of Newham, you know, Newham being one of the one of the birthplaces of grime. And when you look back you can see why, you know, young people just kind of managed to um make something of their own and use use their love, draw on their, the, the music of their parents and grandparents, but make something that was theirs mm. and, you know, help to create a kind of a sense of belonging, I think, in a place that wasn't always easy to be in. That's not just Newham, Newham that's the UK generally. If you're um, from a black or ethnic minority community, it's not always an easy place to be. So it was a... Um it was a creative expression which helped resolve, um, you know, some of the or a reaction to the hardship, the oppression, the um, abuse, isolation, which is often where a lot of great uh, musical movements come from. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just kind of like hip hop in the Bronx, right? It's a very similar drive. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, and and what were some of those? Um, you talked around some of the influences. What were the musical influences for grandparents, parents that helped drive? You think that movement? I su- I, I suppose what I would would say is that that reggae influence was was strong, not just as um, not just as a sound, but also um, in terms of performance. And especially when dancehall came along, the yeah. idea of the sound clash. Yeah. You know, the going back and forth. You know, lots of um, different MCs um, jostling for position, trying to have the best lyrics. You know, to say to say them to say the most and and be at the front. And if you weren't good, you had to move back. And and I suppose from sound system culture as well, this idea of being very um, sort of DIY, building building on what you had. And even though in some ways you can you can see that it's quite individualistic in terms of you know the 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 bragging and the boasting and the wanting to be the best but at the same time there's this collective um spirit these collective endeavors people work together to get the music out to get the sound out to keep the show on the road um and a lot of that um that practice comes from sound system culture mm-hmm. Uh, and then if you overlay that with the kind of sonic influences as well yeah. of um, UK Garage, Jungle and, and so on. Drum and bass. Drum and bass. Then yeah. it does, you know, you can you can hear, especially in those early grime days, you can hear all of that and more That's because sure. the, the young people that were make, making it added their own self and perspectives into it and kind of created something new and that's what made it so exciting i think yeah it was like the um yeah, you can see all the, all the influences the lineage yeah f- from jamaica that's come through yeah. how it's evolved the sounds how they've um transitioned and become more culturally nuanced around what was then like black british culture mm. as well right and uh yeah i think it, i think that's what makes grime so unique Right, it's, it's nowhere else in the world that had that sound. Right, it's, it was it was so East London originally it was just like so London centric. It was it was like it was an amazing time in musical history. I think, you know, from the move out of kind of like club culture. Mm. So so you grew up in East. You set up your business. How did you then get into helping and working or wanting to work around social uh, care? study like did you then go on and study again did you say you were studying part-time yeah so this is it's, it's a strange one so you know because I'm very old right so I've had a really long working life I've had a really long working life and so but I've for the last I uh, probably 25 30 years it's always been in that field of training education and so yep. on so I set up this business in Silvertown we had these young people coming in nobody nobody was interested in vocational qualifications they just wanted to use the computers because we had max and you know um, because of the design bit so everyone would come in and this shows you how long ago it was everyone would have you know the music on their ringtones mm. everyone would have headphones most of them didn't have a pen um, but everyone was listening to the same music and if you were in east, east london at that time in the kind of early 2000s it was it was just a kind of constant backdrop and i you know, it was in my house because I had a daughter that was around that age. I had nephews and nieces that were around that age. And so in typical style, it was just there and I didn't pay any attention, too much attention to mm. it. Um, but because I was always interested in um, young people that were outside of the mould, if you like, the ones that didn't quite fit in the, you know, they're going to do well category, um, I was just really interested that all of these young people that came in were just, um, and some of them were making CDs and selling them in the playground. Some of them were writing their own lyrics. And I just thought, this is just so interesting. Mm. And all of these young people that came in were young people that the school said weren't going to do very well. But they were doing very well. They just didn't fit. They just didn't fit the mould of what was recognised as a successful school career at the time. And what was what was prized was being able to sit quietly, being able to put your hand up, following the rules, doing mm-hmm. as you were told. All of that is useful. All of that is important. However, it's not for everybody and everyone can't do that. And if you're a creative person, it's, 
it can be quite challenging. So, um, yeah, that's what kind of sparked my interest. And I'd always been interested in how um, young people learn, how they develop, you know, how people make um, successful lives for themselves. That, that, was, that was my interest. So the, how did you get into lecturing? Because when I finished, so I came to ac academic life very, very late. I finished my PhD, um, yeah, very late. And I did that part time as well. So it took me seven years. Yeah. Um, and when I first started doing the research, because I did my PhD on grime and entrepreneurship, um, I don't think most people in the academy were impressed. They thought it was a, a bit of a nonsense subject to mm. do a PhD on. There's much more scholarship now. There are so so many people doing doing that doing that good work, and that's a great thing. Um, but so once once I'd finished my PhD, at the same time, um, it was just after the financial crash, so my business kind of came to an end. So I find myself in the 2011 2012s with a PhD, <laughs> no business and no job. So yeah, I, um, I, I lectured uh, in various places for a while, did a number of other jobs, um, and finally land um, where I am now. Amazing. Yeah. And um, let's talk around your first book, or the, or the, the first book I was exposed to, Terraformed, mm. uh, which is your most recent work. Yeah. Um, you talk around like young black lives, you know, and, and it's all around their experience living in inner city environments. Could you please share like the top line synopsis um, and what the what the book covered for those who aren't familiar with your work? So, um, as as I've said, I've always been interested in um, young people and how how they manage to make um, a good life. For themselves a successful life a livable life and over time when I was doing my research and um, because of the young people that I came into contact with um, in my work that I was more and more um, struggling to answer those questions about well for some young people it didn't it doesn't matter it didn't really matter how hard they worked or what they did they couldn't move on from where they were they couldn't you know that you know I left home when I was 20 and I never went back. Mm. You know, um, people are younger for longer now. The The way to move on was to go to university, but then that comes with a, a load of debt, mm -hmm. um, a debt that you might never repay that's always kind of sitting there on your shoulder. Um, the chance of an independent life becomes more and more remote. Um, and because of, um, we've had 40 years of <laughs> neoliberalism, then there's this idea that it's all on you. And so for young people who've grown up in that 40 years, if their life is not successful by whichever measure, that would get turned on them. And they would say, well, you know, I'm not working hard enough. I'm not doing enough. You know, I'm not hustling enough. You know, this thing well, you know. And I was having, um, I didn't have enough words or enough time to explain those kind of stru structural and systemic issues, which is how we got to here, which is that you are working hard enough, you are doing enough, but there are systems and structures um, at play that are out of your control, but do impact on your life mm. um, in some way. And so that's what Terraformed was about, was to try and connect those dots, to try and make sense of some of those um, sociological perspectives that people might not necessarily want to read, but were really important to, to, to understand, to get a sense of where we were. On top of that, we'd had 10 years almost of austerity, 10 years of cuts, 10 years of scaling back um, public services, and the people who were feeling it the most were the people that had the least. And that impacted on how people were able to live um, a successful life. And I just wanted to try and explain that in some way or yeah, yeah. attempt to explain that in some way. Because um, like in the brand world and, and in society, this idea of meritocracy and 
you know, there's a lot of spotlighting and celebrating of like successful people. It's like, oh, you know, you smashed it. Look at these kind of um, self starters, these um, this kind of like this hustle generation that are going on to, do, you know, do amazing stuff. But, you know, what your book is saying is that not everyone has the same opportunity. Uh, meritocracy mer- meritocracy only exists, uh, or it is like a, pr- by principle, it means it's all a, uh, a level playing field, mm. which is not the reality, right? Can you, um, and you know, especially not in underprivileged inner city black communities, and, and you uh, talk around a lot of issues that are facing, you know, you're talking about, look at specifically through the lens of uh, Forest Gate. Can you talk around some of those uh, issues that you cover in the book that um, people within these communities face that make social mobility so difficult that people, brands, might not be aware of? Yeah. So I think that um, I focused on, 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 on Forest Gate because it was an, an area that was becoming um, more and more gentrified. Yeah. Um, gentrification has happened in other places. Yeah. You know, you can look at Hackney, you can look at Peckham, you can look at Brixton. Gentrification happens and it happens at the point where um, certain areas that were deemed to be somehow um, not very desirable become desirable for one reason or another. Yeah. But for um, communities, existing communities, often that, that means that they get displaced. Yeah. So... Forest Gate was a place that was becoming more and more gentrified, or some parts of it were anyway. And so I wanted, I used that as a way to just look at some of the issues that I wanted to talk about in terms of life chances, in terms of opportunities. Mm-hmm. And so for um, some of the people from the more well-off communities, the newer communities that were arriving, could, you know, because they could afford to live in comfortable homes, mm-hmm. um, could live in homes with gardens, um at the same time the local authority was trying to develop the 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 high street as a kind of urban village mm-hmm. um and re- rebrand it and look and and looked on the places that you know there's kind of small blocks of flats um the the, the side streets you know and and kind of designated those areas as places of high crime places that needed to be changed in some way um, and on the surface, on the surface, um, then yeah, why wouldn't you want um, uh, a, a better looking environment, an environment that feels safer? But, but we also have to recognise that some other things are at play, how young black people come into contact um, with the criminal justice system very easily, mm-hmm. because if you use... Um, they were ASBOs, antisocial behaviour orders. I can't remember what they're called now. But they're way, very easy ways for young people to, to get caught up in a criminal justice system. Mm-hmm. Stand on a street corner, make, make a noise, and you can get caught up in a criminal justice system. Mm-hmm. Once that process starts, it's not um, like before when you could, it was, you could come back from a youthful mistake. That stays with you, and it stays with you to the point where in some instances, you can't open a bank account, you can't apply for certain courses, and people get stuck. From such a young age. Yeah, people get stuck. Um, and that's not even, that's without even thinking about those kind of more um, serious or more extreme um, uh, ways that, um, that, 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 that exist. And so I think you have, we have these kind of parallel worlds where... For some, for some, um, life is a world of opportunity um, where meritocracy might work, but does it really? Because usually people have a connection, yeah, yeah. someone they know, someone that will open the door for them, especially in the creative industries, mm-hmm. which is where a lot of young people want to work. These are highly desirable jobs. They can't get in those. Mm-hmm. Um, the creative sector, there's um, a great deal of research that shows that the creative sector, including music, is still overwhelmingly white and middle mm-hmm. class. For sure, yeah. You know, these these are young places that young people want want to um, want to participate in, the and access. they can't. Yeah, yeah. And the, the the access isn't there, and so you have that. Yeah, these kind of communities that live side by side that don't touch communities that that live in a very kind of um, 
yeah, rich and rewarding way. But at the same time, we've got young people that live in very small spaces with very limited options and very few choices. So, and um, what, um, what are the other barriers or um, challenges that the communities that you're talking about face that prevent and make success and social mobility so difficult? I think it's, it's, it's access to opportunities and it's access to, it's access to the kind of social, economic and cultural um, capital. Yeah. So it's more than, um, so when austerity struck, so after the 2008 um, financial crash and everybody starts to roll back because, you know, they have to save money, you can't cut, well, you can, but you can't cut too much from the statutory services. But you can cut the youth services because mm. they're not statutory. So most bu- most boroughs cut all their youth services. I think some are trying to rebuild them now. But there was a study that said, at one point, I think, 80% in some boroughs. Since 2010. Yeah, 80% of the youth Indeed. services got cut. So it's, it's um, young people, younger people and young adults need places to go and things to do so places to go after school places where you can be in com- where you can be in community with one another where you can share food and laughter and, and 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 some joy otherwise what do we end up with we end up with a um uh groups of people that find it difficult to connect with each other on a human level and so when i'm talking about the kind of social cultural and economic capital economic in terms of well they have to have some resources you know can't assume that families can provide everything and nor should they you know um we're supposed to be a society which means we're supposed to look out look out for and take care of each other and somewhere along the way um with our um neoliberal agenda i think we kind of forgot that we lost that and um, you talked around new services being cut. Brands, I believe, have the finance and the resources to be able to create positive impact at the heart of youth communities that need that are under resourced and need their help. Especially when it's those inner city environments, often where cool comes from, mm. right? And it's what they trade on. Yeah. So, um, if you know, if, what advice could you give to a brand um, in terms of how they could support and alleviate some of those inner city pressures? I think I would I would I would um, caveat everything that I'm going to say in that brands are uh, the the comments I'm going to make brands are part of so I think that these things the role the who should provide these things who should provide these services is the role of government local authorities this is why we pay tax this is why we're a society this is why we're here this is the social contract this is why we're citizens mm. it shouldn't be it shouldn't be um at the mercy of some commercial enterprise or yeah, other so that that's sense. my that's my yeah, having I'm... said all of that having said all of that <laughs> yeah that in the same way that multiculturalism is used as a backdrop to create an urban village where you know, new and wealthier people will want to come because, yeah, yeah. you know, they want an, uh, a suburban lifestyle, but suburban lifestyle in an urban setting, then, you know, unfortunately, I think brands are guilty of doing the same thing, that they'll use the 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 culture and the aesthetics, the and the aesthetics yeah. as a backdrop, as something that's cool. But they really do have to ask yourself, well, it can't all be one way. What do the people who are providing the call, the aesthetic, the, the multicultural back, backdrop, the endless shots of um, uh, pictures outside of tower blocks, blocks yeah, yeah. and all the rest of it, what do they get? Yeah. What, 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 what goes back? It, a lot comes out, you know, look at the charts, look at the look at advertising, look at fashion, look at absolutely everything. A lot comes out. And then, so you have to wonder about being, uh, it, it's, the relationship shouldn't be parasitic. It should be two-way, or, yeah. And I, I agree. So, 
Yeah, I, yes, ideally in a perfect world, the government would provide. Yeah. Okay, short term though, it's like, I think brands have fuck loads of money, right? They, they, they owe do. a lot. But yeah, they, like you said, is they are borrowing the aesthetics, the identity of often underprivileged, mm. predominantly black, yeah, um, inner city communities. Yes, they're giving tons of money to key individuals that have, like you said in the book, that have left, that once they get the money, they leave the ghetto or leave like, you know, tough areas that they grew up with mm. and, and they're, they're out, they're gone anyway. So they're not even part of that community. And they're working with a few, a few kind of like rising starts, but it's like, what could brands do to the community, you know, to the communities that they believe doesn't have much cultural equity? You know, that what could they be, be giving back? And it's, it's, it's not, it's not difficult. Do you know, yeah. do you know, that's, that's, that's the, that's the sad thing is that, um, we, you know, we do know what to do and, and there are people out there already doing stuff, you know, so you, what you have to do is do your fact finding um, and see what young people in particular are putting in place in their communities. Um, all kinds of services, all kind of all kinds of um, initiatives, so that young people can take care of each other. You know, um, well-being workshops, um, uh, organisations that will support you after you've come out of out of prison. Yeah. Um, all kinds of youth activities, meditation. Uh, all of this is happening. Yeah. What you know, brands are very good at finding a customer base. What I'm saying is that the, the, they're there already and make the, so, and build something that's, that lasts, not something that's transient, not a kind of, um, a kind of, uh, of the, a kind of a campaign only or a yeah, seasonal you know, initiative. Those black squares did nothing for anybody, <laughs> yeah. um, except make maybe one or two people feel good at the time. So something that's sustainable and something that that lasts buildings staff you know staff come with knowledge and resources and ways to make young people feel safe so build something of substance that can be sustained and for the young people that are doing the work anyway or have ideas anyway don't gatekeep don't gatekeep make it very easy for young people to access you and your funds because at the moment what happens is someone has this great idea yeah. and they think what I really want what I really want to do so for example we've been trying to get these well-being um, workshops off the ground for, mm -hmm. for ages young woman who's uh, just turned 21 mm -hmm. wanting to do all these things in her borough the process is so long to try and get any funding for everything brands have their own money they can jump all of that they can for make, sure. they could make all of that happen they and, could uh, yeah it's sick that's a good idea because you're right, it's like there is no bureaucracy. It's like one or two people that are set on, you know, significant amount of money that can literally, you get in contact, hey, look, we've got this initiative. Do you want to support a yes or no? Yes. Done. Yeah. I think it's so the idea that rather than trying to necessarily go and create something that you own, is maybe just finance and be patrons of, of pre-existing initiatives that are by the community for the community. Yeah. So it's like, it's just, you're acting like a record label, you're just financing, supporting, mm -hmm. put, putting these kind of like bombs of resource, just like, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Yeah. That that could be a really nice initiative in a way that they can then offset some of that um, debt that they have to the culture that ultimately is making them millions and millions of pounds. Yeah. And I think that's something um, that's really easy to do, right? It's like, it's, it's not complicated. It's just about having a certain amount of spend every year. So if you're spending, uh, I don't know, say you're 10 million on a campaign, right? Which is, you know, in a year, and it's really heavily rooted within black culture. It's like maybe 5% goes back to the communities, you know, with, with, and, the, and there's no transaction, it's not, it's not a value trade. It's just here and to support, right? And I think that, that could really change change the relationships yeah because i think one of the things that's so challenging especially for young people is that you know the the if the process is very very long and very very complicated and you have to jump through x amount of hoops then it can't be it's just too it's, much it's, it when when you've got all of this other stuff to manage um um in your life and in your neighborhood as well 
it, it is too much. It might seem a simple, oh, just fill in this form or just just do this or just do that. Those 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 brands with their with their spend and their access to resources could make that process, that way of doing things very, Super very easy. straightforward indeed. They just really could. S- simple vox pops to camera, this is the idea, here it is, submit. Yeah. Because yeah, and that's something interesting, right? It's look, people don't understand that yes, you want to be an entrepreneur and yes, you want to you know, you have this initiative that's gonna help your community. Right, which is uh, uh, um, an ambition that's difficult for anyone. But then, like you said, the things that are going on outside of this is it, it take is fully consuming. You know, growing up in a hostile environment, mm. it makes it almost impossible. And this is the thing where the uh, the lack of equality means that you know you're already five steps back because you know you've got to navigate some really tough environments. It's like it's almost impossible. Yeah. And I think the brands don't. I think people don't necessarily yeah. register how how hard that is. I think I think it it happens. It happens more and more, and especially because there is that disconnect. There is a disconnect between, you know. I spoke before about how the creative sector is white overwhelming middle white and middle yeah, class. Yeah, yeah, sure. com- white middle class male. Yeah, and there's a complete disconnect between the lives that pe- the the lives that people live that are um, represented by media companies, whichever, which, of, of, of whichever style, style or pattern, but without a recognition of what, what that real life is. It's, a, it's, it's, it's window dressing for them and it's real life to the rest of us. Yeah. And, you know, you talked on these urban villages, urban environments, and something that you talked around in the, one of your books is about the uh, opaque exclusion. Mm. And then, do you want to just summarize what you know? What does that? What does it? What do you mean by opaque uh, uh, exclusion? And then we could talk about how the brands make the high street or make inner city areas more inclusive to help mm. to help counter that issue. I think that um, with that opaque exclusion, I suppose if if, if you think about the development of um, Leisure spaces, so what you think is public space isn't. So places like, you know, these large shopping centres, yeah. they're private space. They have security guards. If, as we've already said, that most community space has gone now, then the community space is leisure space. To get into the leisure space, you need money. You have to be a customer. Okay. So if you haven't got six pounds to buy the coffee you're not sitting in that cafe. If you, if you haven't got anything to spend, you're not really getting past that. Sec- and the security guard can run you off at any time. Have you ever been at the one in King's Cross? Is it Cold Drops? Have you ever been there? I know what you mean. It's, it's... All of that, that's all private. And so they can decide who comes in and who comes out. Yeah, so these kind of um, so congregation points are actually gated. You can't congregate in the same way that you did. How do you build community and human relationship integration you can't you, can't, you right. can't do it so the people who can congregate are the people who have finance to to go into these leisure spaces and almost everybody else is excluded from those spaces so in some weird other dimension you can walk past a, a major um, sports store with lots of um, <laughs> lots of young black people in the imagery, but they're not in the shop as customers. Or they're, or they're not in the shopping centre. Or if they are in the shopping centre, they are being just, surveilled yeah, yeah. closely. And, and that's and, and there's a lot of people that be listening to this that are you know working within the sportswear category. You know they have um, faces within some of the biggest um, retail spaces, and it's you know getting them to think about some of those. You know those points of isolation or exclusion that most people just don't see, and thinking about that, right? You know, actually, how inclusive are we, really? Not not just having imagery of black rappers in 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 the in the store, right? It's like, you know, how are we for people that don't have any money to be still be included within this kind of community that brands ideally like to try and position themselves around mm. to help resolve that? And I think that for me, I never thought about that. You know, it's, it's crazy, it, it's, it, mad. It, doesn't I can't I, it, yeah it's it's quite difficult to kind of make make sense of it and so for 
those, for, so for those brands, they have to come out of their towers and they have to get some kind of understanding about, you know, what, you know, what it's like to navigate through some of these spaces um, as, as, as a young black person. I am no longer young, but depending on where I go, um, I'm usually a shoplifter because, you know, I can, I can have my personal security guard in certain shops. They'll walk with me. They'll appear at the end of every aisle, you know, and it depends whether they can see my, Smart. See my hair or, or not. But, you know, those... And because I'm older, I can uh, shrug and know that this is really tiresome. But imagine how damaging and how draining that is to forever be under that kind of neg negative type of surveillance. And we haven't left young people um, in some areas with very many places to go. So it's like I live in Leighton and there's the high street, right? And it's now been converted into kind of like a pedestrian spot, right? Uh, kind of like Cobble Street vibes, like artisan <coughs> record stores, art artisan um, coffee shops, like a couple like healthy food or like organic food um, shops. But it also used to be where all the local in my in that part of uh, Leighton, right? It's, it's predominantly Somalian, right? All the Somalian kids would hang out, right? And they're basically the the youth in the, in that area of like say fourteen to eighteen. I said below five or six were all the kind of gentrified first generation sort of yummy mummy sort of vibes, right? And they have been like they had um, they have been slowly pushed out of that area, completely made to feel excluded. They are not seen in any of the kind of street activities or events that they try and do for the community. It's like it's for like minded or like. Uh, community rather than actually the, and, and you see it they're pushed away pushed away into further uh, back streets alleyways you know and, and even by the police the police you know would have a patrol car there to try and keep them away from there you know and yeah all right cool they're smoking weed and hanging out but it's like where else we it's for real integration it's like you know they could benefit from being they would benefit from being part of the community if they were integrated, but yet they were seen, always seen outsiders. And there's this weird, like, parallel universe, you know, that exists, right? And I, I remember watching and just thinking, fucking hell, man, it's so dark that, you know, this is late and this is their home, this is, this is their, their, their area that's slowly being made to feel like an alien yeah. you know, with their environment. I think brands really need to understand around, with trading off black culture, like some of the, you know, the realities for the majority. Yes, there's a very small minority that go on and do amazing things, and yeah. but the ninety five percent. But in in order for that minority to go on and do those amazing things, they they didn't they didn't rise up on their own. They had they had families. Yes. They had communities. They had uh, people that were giving them moral support. You know all of these things. Uh, you know this 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 hyper individualistic approach to life will have us believing that we just roll through and do it all by us. Nobody does it all by themselves, whoever they are. No. They have, everyone has people and everyone has, um, yeah, they have, they, they have, they have pe people with them. What we see is the, the successful person at the forefront. That's what we see. But behind all of that backstage, you know. It's a whole entourage. Yeah, so, someone's, someone's cooking. Someone's... Finding your shoe. Do, do you know what I mean? Someone, it's, someone is giving you the money to top up your car so you can get there. Someone's giving you a lift in those early days. You know, all of those things, all of those things that are small, um, may, m might seem of, of little or no consequence, you know, it isn't, it isn't the, the single Herculean endeavour from one individual, I would suggest, I, you know... It's it's always about community, and and we are seeing in a lot of the youth research that we're doing that's focused on inner city kids that there is a stronger sentiment around community. I feel like there is a shift, you know, with younger generations from a more individualistic to a collective consciousness. It's going to take time, mm. but it is definitely a, tr a a trend that we're seeing. So let's talk about your um, your second book, right? Can you give a synopsis of um, 
the book that you did around crime culture and the uh, link to entrepreneurism. All right. It's the other way around. Okay. It's the other way around because the Urban Music and Entrepreneurship was the first book that I wrote. It was based on my PhD. Okay. Terraformed was the second book. So okay. Terraformed came out in 2020 um, in the pandemic. So I yeah. didn't think anyone was going to read it, but they did. Yeah. But Urban Music and Entrepreneurship was based on um, my PhD research. So I, um, I thought I was going to look at why young people didn't stay at school or became neat not in education employment or training yeah it pretty soon became apparent that 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 i wasn't interested in that i was interested in how um young people use their their passion and interest for music and at that time it was grime to create work for themselves um and for other people as well in the end and so these were um young people that really wanted to be you know in in that creative field in some way so some uh, many of them were mcs but a lot of them weren't I interviewed people that were uh, video directors, content creators, photographers, yeah. stylists, event prom managers, the whole promoters, thing, the whole thing, broadcasters, so, yeah, producers, yep, all all of that, and so um, it sort of it quickly became apparent to me. So I did um, my research was ethnographic, which means that you know you 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 study people so you you go out into your into your object of study so there was me with my 40 something year old self going to clubs um i went to ayanapa to do field research so what year was that resort. what was you was that i was there 2009 i went there when was i was like 17 when i went there it was yeah. sick i i wasn't 17 i was much older because that was that was like grime took over napa like napa was ibifa to electronic music right mm. it's like it was yeah. it was mad how how it just went to this random island. Yeah, but it was what was so interesting is I think there there'd been a kind of garage scene there okay. before, and um, but what was really interesting was how, you know, um, because people wanted to listen to the music, they would go. They would, so there's this whole market marketplace was um, developed in a place like Iron Apple, and people would go, um, and. It meant that the clubs were full. There was one guy who went um, there was a, as, a, as a visitor, realised that people were staying for a long time and their hair was getting messy and he went back the following year and set up a barber shop. And um, there was a Caribbean takeaway. So all of these... Makes all sense. Of, all of this enterprise, if you like, that wasn't really recognised as enterprise because it wasn't done in a kind of textbook, you know, here's the business manual way. And also this idea that the informal music economy and the formal music economy were very separate. I know in the formal economy, things happen like this. There's a contract, it's, you know, and discussed and signed. And in the informal economy, there was this idea that it was a free-for-all, but it wasn't. There was lots of overlap. It's complex. Very complex. People operating with a foot in both camps. Yeah. Um, big event promoters, for example, not distinguishing between... Um, whether somebody was um, in a formal or informal economy didn't matter. And so it, my, my PhD was about rethinking what entrepreneurship was and why didn't we recognise these young people that were doing all these enterprising things as entrepreneurs. Um, and then just, you know, just identifying some of the, the business ideas and, and business practice that had come, come out of that. And they did lay a blueprint, those, those um, early, uh, the early grime scene did lay a blueprint for what came after, with that kind of, well, we don't need to wait for a record company and we don't actually need an intermediary. We can just get on and do it. We can put our EMA together and make this happen and we can do whatever. We can share skills, we can collaborate. The music will get out there. The event will happen. It's like it was kind of this amazing. It was, some of it was like bootlegging, bootstrapping, yeah. uh, like self-starting DIY nature that came out of this this community, right? That was mad impressive. Whether it people like pushing CDs, doing mad CD sales at the back of cars, you know, going Wembley Market, sending DVDs, and like you know, filming the movement, which at the time seemed mad, right? Because actually, the only connection with the culture was through bootleg CDs, right? Yeah. And it was, you know, it was, there was no other world, sharing files maybe on, like, Sidewinder files on phones or whatever. But talk to me a bit about how you describe the um, grime culture economy. 
So I think, I think um, at the time and in the book, I described it as in, in that way as a yeah. kind of D- DIY, but also at the same time, um, being very savvy about what um, those advances in technology could do. So when I was doing my um, field research, which was probably from about 2007, so Facebook was new, YouTube was new, um, but very quickly um, the people who were working in uh, in the grime um, scene then kind of adopted those technologies and made use of them in ways that did set a kind of foundation for what for what came after. And so I would be interviewing a young MC, an 18-year-old one in um, um, in East London, in Plaster. Who was it? And I said to Who was it? I'm not telling you. And I said, at the end of every interview, I said the same thing. Have you said everything that you want to say about yourself? What else do you need to know? Uh, what else do we need to know about you? And I said, oh, you know, Google was quite new then as well. I said, oh, Joy, just Google me. See what comes up. And the rest. And I did. And um, they had a fan base in Croatia. And they'd, they'd never been to Croatia. And so very early on, using internet, social media, all of those different platforms to build fan bases, um, share their work with audiences all, all around the world. And then since then, um, I've seen Danish grime, Australian grime, Japanese grime, and so on. Just grime in, I was just doing a, 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 some research around um, emerging music trends in Nigeria. It's like... There's a local grime scene there, yeah. legit grime scene. Yeah, so I saw something on Brazil the other day as well. So Albania was grime scene. Yeah, it's, and it's just it's just incredible to think how um, those young people at that time that wanted to have fun, that wanted something to do, and had a place to do it. So even if there wasn't the youth centre, there was the stairwell or other people's, you know, their, blocks, their own houses, the, the blocks. Stairwell, jammers, basement. Yeah, so all of these um, these, these locations, these emancipatory spaces where people could go, be together and just and just try something. And I think that that was really important. I think it's a shame that we've lost that to a, to a great extent. Because it's not there, it's not, I've never seen it like that again. Mm. It's like the community vibes, like finding, like we have to put on shows in the maddest venues because no one would book crimes. Like, the police would just go through it. Like, who is that? No, no, no you can't do that. Yeah. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. Yeah. It's not going to be in London. It's not going to happen. It's like, you. it was almost like it was continuously um, attempts to extinguish it. Yeah. But at the same time, it flourished from the grassroots up with nothing. You know, Rinse FM, amazing job. Like, you know, all the pirate radio station people, like, putting up you know um aerials and dishes to be able to broadcast to local areas the whole uh dvd the the, the kind of uh, mixtapes uh, cd packs the flyer packs mm. it was mad entrepreneurial but like you said in your book like that's not recognized they would be recognized as unemployed right and mm. and, and and be another statistic around a group of people that aren't doing anything but it, the most entrepreneurial people and community that i've been party to yeah and I think it is about it is about perspective and it is about perception, and you know, in the same way that we have to shake up our our ideas about what an entrepreneur is and what yeah. enterprise looks like, we have to shake up our ideas about you know what um, you know what young people in the inner city are doing or not doing, and what we, what what we look look at as noise, and um, yeah. They, they, we have to harness that energy somehow. And brands can facilitate yeah. that, man. They can amplify it, platform it, yeah. bring it together. It's like they can become cultural a and arts. literally go in and see movements like that and be like, oh, how can we make this happen, guys? What do you need from us? It's like they're, they're, you know, there's so much opportunity to be able to, one, be as, assimilate and be associated with something that's really influential. But two is to help propel and grow yeah. and really give more than you get. And like that is where you would be accepted, right? It's like I'm even the grime scene, like a few brands, there's more like anyone that supported it was fully embraced. You know, like King Apparel and there's a there's a lot of brands at the time, very small independent brands yeah. that just helped make start things and made them possible. But it was ultimately like self funded. 
you know, from a community that had no resource. So I, th- I think that, you know, it's the, 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 the times kind of now, really, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know how, if, even, even if you don't, even if you don't um, live um, in, in the, the areas that, um, that are under siege in a lot of ways, you can't help but know, you know, how challenging some of those, those places can be. And, um, and there is, yeah, there's a real opportunity to, to, to make that investment and to do something about it. And one of the things that I, f- I forgot to say about those early grime days was, as you were saying, there were many, many attempts to kind of stop it, to, um, but it became very nimble and managed to kind of um, subvert and overcome all of these obstacles. And that's yeah. part of the foundation and the blueprint as well. And so I think that um, what brands can do is kind of embrace that idea of something that's so nimble and so flexible. And they were doing it, they were doing it all those years ago with very little. Yeah. And so how difficult is it to adopt the same kind of um, position and attitudes and efforts with so much. <laughs> Do you see yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So if you can if you can build something from the ground up with not much that has an a so a social, economic and cultural influence that cannot be overestimated because um, Grime shook up the world. It made such a difference not only to the lives that the for the people that were making it and the and the successes if you like but also because it showed it showed the way it showed what could be done it showed what was possible um it gave young people a sense of belonging and, and a sense of place in a place that in a lot of ways wasn't what um didn't seem to be for them so you can't underestimate it was that. like the dizzy track i love you to come out yeah was a rallying cry yeah and a representation of a group of people that were just outcasts in society like for the first time you saw someone that was like damn for loads of people like that is literally me right you, you know an icon a social icon for the first time and it's like someone that's really aspirational that came from the environment that you're talking about this was like bo right he frees like it was a, it was a m- massive moment, right? I don't think people understand like that moment in time. I was in school at the time. It just it, like you saw like, you know, there were so many kids in my school that just like grew as a result of that. Yeah. It was mad to see. It was sick. It's like you know, even our we started talent shows were all it was all grime on grime music in our talent shows at school, um, and I think it was massive. Like I remember like grew up in you know. A lot of my friends grew up in, in an environment that was very multicultural, and I remember just seeing people uh, flourish as a result. Right? It was it was it was amazing. Um, this, oh, but ultimately, it came from black culture, right? Like like most things in, in pop culture, I I think anyway in, in today's society. What is it about the black creative expression that is so influential? I know you talk you covered some po- really interesting points in the book. Yeah, I mean, I'd. I'd... I said this. Uh, it's 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 quite a difficult one for me to for me to answer. I think I think because I've just grown up around, and I've and researched around <laughs> the things that I'm interested in. I think that one of the things about black creative expression is about want want wanting to. Wanting to leave your place, your 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 mark, in the world, and in the end, if it's art or music or whatever it is, it can't it it's part of you. It can't be taken from you. And out of those kind of out of the the kind of privations of everyday life, which is contemporary life, and the kind of um, historical experiences of who we are and where we're from. Then I think it. I think it's that, and and I think that it's that that resonates with people when um, who are may not necessarily be part of the culture, 
But what people can hold on to is those, yeah, the the, 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 the struggle for freedom and liberation and being able to express yourself and, yeah, sing a new song and be free. All, all, all and, you know, and it might, all of that might not come across in a sound or a form that you like or that resonates with you. But at the heart of it, isn't that what, isn't that what it is? I think that's what it is. Mm-hmm. I think that's what, I think that's what, um, that, that, that people try and do. And then the other thing, because, you know, the black diaspora and it draws on all of those influences, it just kind of flow through black creative expression. So it's, it's the international It's scale. borderless. It's borderless. That's what you said in the it's book. Borderless. Yeah. It's the movement as well, it, right? It flows. And so you're talking about grime as being, you know, something from the UK, something from here, but those sonic influences go back through hip hop and, and so on, hip hop, back to R and B. And then of course you have the Jamaican influence on hip hop and so on. There are no borders. Blues. With, yeah. With black creative expression, that flow, that reworking of what's gone before. Um, so it's, oh, that's it that you said. It's the reworking, the yeah. remastering, it's the remixing, it's the, the yeah. layering, the stacking. Because uh, I can't remember, there's a model that you talked around. Was it the Atlantic model? The black Atlantic model. So that's um, uh, Professor Paul Gilroy's um, um, concept of the, 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 the flow of black creative expression, black musical forms across borders. Um, and so that you, you go beyond that kind of idea of um, nations. I went to um, I went to Jamaica in the summer and um, hearing Afrobeat, hearing yeah Afrobeats are really popular, but again you can hear the kind of sonic flow of 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 of, of those of those sounds and why it, and you and you can just feel why it's so so popular, and it's part of why yeah so yeah I think. That's that's what it is. And it's fast that when I read that, I was like, "Damn!" It's yeah. like for the first time being able to like some theory around yeah. something that's so obvious, yeah, right. And so it's like everywhere; it's dominating everywhere. And and even if you go to, um, I don't know, you go to Berlin, and you know, you look at you know the Turkish inner city um, yeah. population. Is, you know, they are still adopting and appropriating that the kind of the the black cultural expression and sound and making it their own it's almost become like a a vehicle for inner city expression globally yeah which is which is amazing you know it's, it's crazy the impact i don't think people understand you know the relevance and the continued relevance and the continued source of anything that's interesting or cool seems to always trickle back or root back to yeah. you know the black creative economy um Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. I'm going to share the links in the description for your work. Amazing reads. There's a lot of that, a ton of work um, being put into the um, that, that, that body of work. And it's, you know, it's, I've seen things in a different light as a result. And I've done a ton of reading in this space already. So it was, um, yeah, it was, it was definitely worth the time and money. We finish uh, every one of the our episodes with a quick... Crep check. <laughs> Today, I, uh, tell us what you got on your feet. Well, I think these are, I, I never, Adidas, Oswego's. Oswego's, very nice. Yeah, you know, but they're very, very, very comfortable. Comfort I, matters. <laughs> I, I've got the Nike Air Flight uh, 89s on. Um, this is Back to School. Dr. Joy White, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we out. Thanks. <laughs> Yo, salute to everyone for listening to Back to School. Uh, if you like what you heard today, hit us up on nerdscollective.com. That's N-E-R-D-S-C-O-L-L-E-C-T-I-V-E.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Ah, oh, yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. And we out of, out of.